All resources for this episode are provided in the show notes. This episode is brought to you by Mere Liberty Courses, teaching youth and adults the principles of thinking well through a holistic approach to the Socratic method. For more information and to see what students are saying, visit courses.mereliberty.com. In today's episode, Are Ordained Deaconesses Compatible with Historic Christian Orthodoxy? Complementarians insist not. Egalitarians insist yes. A recently published book by medieval historian and Baptist egalitarian Beth Allison Barr claims that women were most definitely ordained as deacons. But what is a deaconess? And is there really a conspiracy by white evangelical men to keep women held down and forbid them from callings to service in the church? Is this an either-or issue? That is, either the church is patriarchal or egalitarian? Is this a gendered issue? That is, is there some quality of maleness that makes men more suited for leadership? Or is the root of the problem to be found elsewhere? In this episode, I invited a seminary-trained deaconess from the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, to help shed some light on a confessional Lutheran view of the history of deaconesses and the roles of women in the church. You may be interested to know that questions and controversy being raised in the complementarian-egalitarian debate is not really a big deal in the LCMS, but why might be the more important question. We happened to record this episode on the first day of the Southern Baptist Convention's annual meeting, where women's ordination has been a hot topic. I suspect that the issue Baptists and complementarians are facing is more likely due to their lack of doctrine on ordination than on matters of gender. And since Presbyterians do have a doctrine of ordination, where does that leave us on the matter of deaconesses in the church? Join me, Carrie Baldwin with Deaconess Melissa DeGroat as we dare to think about the ordination of women deacons. All right, today I have a very special guest I'm super excited about. Her name is Melissa DeGroot. She is a certified and consecrated deaconess in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. She studied theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. She served at the seminary in recruitment and formation, then later with the Synod as a writer researcher for the LCMS Deaconess Department based out of St. Louis, Missouri. She has been a contributor to blogs, including He Remembers the Baron and The Lutheran Witness. Um, Let's see, she was a weekly guest on KFUO Radio's Bible Study segment, DeGroat has also written articles pertaining to theology, women's roles, and the vocation of deaconess in the Lutheran Witness, Higher Things Magazine, and For the Life of the World. She has also written and contributed to two books, He Remembers the Baron, both editions by Katie Schuerman, and Never Forsaken, God's Mercy in the Midst of Miscarriage by Deaconess Catherine Ziegler. Melissa currently resides in Rio Rancho, New Mexico with her husband, son, and dog, and has recently tried her hand at putting up shiplap, I bet that was fun, (laughs) while DIYing has seemingly taken over her life. She prefers reading, hiking, cooking, and great conversation, and I have to say, Melissa, we've had some great conversations. (laughs) Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I invited you here today to draw out some of our common ground and our distinctives in an effort to flesh out some of these questions that are swirling around in the Reformed world. And you can tell me if they're swirling around in the Lutheran world. But it has to do with women's ordination, women teaching how, you know, where they serve in the church, are they reflective of female stereotypes, and and so on and so forth. So straight off the bat, I want to lay out our cards on the table. This is a volatile topic for the Reformed world. So I want to make sure that everybody listening can just sit back and relax. (laughs) 
You breathe. Yes. <laughs> you obviously favor deaconesses. Um, mm -hmm. And as we get talking more, we're going to flesh out what that actually means from a confessional Lutheran perspective. I do not favor de deaconesses from a Presbyterian Westminster Confession uh, perspective, but our reasons why have nothing to do with the complementarian egalitarian debate. Mm -hmm. We both agree, actually, uh, that women should not be ordained. And again, we're going to get into that. Do you want to add to anything? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I was thinking about this because um, this conversation between you and I started probably a little over uh, about a year ago, right? Yep. Um, and I just remember, you know, listening to you and you having that philosophy background, a rich philosophy background. And I was like, oh, I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> 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 but, you know, I, I did some homework and, you know, and, and um, what's funny is when you're talking about the complementarian and egalitarian debates, I actually, you know, talked to some of my deaconess friends and colleagues, you know, and, and they were not fully aware. And this doesn't mean mm. that there aren't things going on in Lutheranism. I, I want to preface or, or just add that I am not currently in a placement as a deaconess. And so I am not fully in the loop of like the inner dialogues and, and I don't want to say infighting, but you sure. know, let's, let's be honest, you know, there's some, some of that mm -hmm. um, going on in every church body. Just to, to know that I did actually reach out. My husband is a pastor. And yep. so um, I, you know, talked to him a little bit about it and then uh, to my deaconess uh, friends and, and they were not fully aware of the conversation. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just say that I have to say with regards to, you know, between the Google, the internet search and then my conversations with my Lutheran friends, there might be a reason why we don't uh -huh. really talk about it. So yeah. <laughs> I imagine that people listening to this are going to be coming from various backgrounds, Lutheran, Reformed, Complementarian, Egalitarian, Feminist, sure. Patriarchalist, like the whole gamut. So what I want to start off with is just some definitions of terms so that we all understand what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Complementarianism, I've summed up this way, it's a doctrine articulated and formalized by the Danvers Statement and subsequently developed by the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. They argue for ontological gender distinctions and gender roles that make women subordinate to men in various spheres of society. And they are against women's ordination to include deaconesses. Egalitarianism is a doctrine of biblical equality of the genders, i.e. no ontological gender roles, and thus no need to prohibit women's ordination. And I think they, they use the existence of deaconesses through church history as sort of their evidence. Now, I describe egalitarianism as a flattening out of gender distinctions. Mm -hmm. while complementarianism flattens out gender dynamics. Mm -hmm. So I think personally, um, and I've said this before, I'm neither complementarian nor egalitarian. I think they fundamentally fail both men and women. So definitions of terms out of the way. We're going to start off talking about what ordination is. We did open this episode saying that you are a consecrated deaconess and we both oppose women's ordination. So I'm going to open the floor <laughs> to you, Melissa. How the heck can that be? Yeah. So we've had this conversation and these terminologies can get a little bit muddied. And so consecrated simply means, um, you know, set apart from for service. So the doctrine of ordination in Augsburg 14 states that of ecclesiastical order, that no one should publicly teach in the church or administer the sacraments unless he be regularly called. Short and sweet. I mean, there's obviously a confutation and a defense of, mm -hmm. of that, you know, historical and, and uh, theological. You know, the pronoun, the male pronoun he is, is not arbitrary, and it, it is in connection to First Timothy 2 and the Great Commission, you know, Matthew 28, 20, which, of course, certainly has some disputes. 
if we're understanding the actual office, like the predagompt, the preaching office that Christ is sending these men out, and so there's there's good theological precedent for that. And then scripture, of course, interprets scripture um, as far as First Timothy 2 is concerned. And then, you know, we can talk about Ephesians 5 that talks about marriage, but most specifically about how men are supposed to be sacrificial. And so the office of the ministry is specifically that special office that, you know, preaches, teaches, and administers the sacraments. Mm-hmm. So we were comparing notes between the Westminster Confession and the Augsburg Confession. Uh, The the verses that we use to back up ordination in the Westminster Confession, I think are very similar to the Augsburg. We also refer to Matthew 28. We consider that there are basically two offices, special office of ministry, which is reserved to qualified men only, and Mm -hmm. then the general office of believer, or what the Lutherans call the priesthood of all believers. Mm -hmm. And that's based on, you know, first Peter two, nine, and is reflected in Ephesians four and Matthew 18 and Galatians six, and first Thessalonians five, I'd say we have a we're pretty in line together Mm -hmm. with with that, um, and our, our view of ordination. We also want to talk about vocation. I had sent you an article from a Reformed perspective, and it says this, vocation is the work that people perform in their daily lives, is part of God's providential care for his creation. Just as God created Adam to work in the garden and care for the creatures around him, so people continue to fulfill God's plan by performing works that contribute to creation's continuation. So this is going to include things like practicing medicine and education and child rearing and agriculture and engaging in business and teaching and like all the stuff, right? All the stuff that we do, that's Mm -hmm. vocation. And so we would say that, you know, any Christian can have a calling to vocation. Um, You guys include deaconess under vocation. It's not ordained. Mm -hmm. And then there's also set apart the, the special calling for ordination that is reserved for qualified men only. Yeah. I I mean, I love talking about the doctrine of vocation too. And I mean, there's so many books, but of course the two main ones from the Lutheran perspective is uh, Gustav Wingren's um, Luther on vocation, which every time I talk about it, people think I'm typoing and saying, oh, Luther on vacation. (laughs) (laughs) So, and then of course, Jean Edward Veith's um, God at Work, which is a lay friendly read that just really drives home a lot of the points that, that Wingren is, you know, he, he was, German, so they're trying to translate his text into yeah. English. And so. There's a lot of people who are Baptist. They have a statement of faith. They do call it a confession. Uh, they've got this quote on their section for the church. It reads, each congregation operates under the Lordship of Christ through democratic processes in such congregation, each member is responsible and accountable to Christ as Lord. Its scriptural officers are pastors and deacons, while both men and women are gifted for service in the church. The office of pastor is limited to men as qualified by scripture. Now, the reason why I bring up Baptists is because the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood was largely created by Baptists. John Piper, who uh, started to weigh in on reformed theology at some point, but also Paige and Dorothy Patterson, they were part of the formation. Um, Some other names that I'm not recalling off the top of my head, but by and large, the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood uh, was created based on a largely Baptistic doctrine. Um, And one point that I want to make about John Piper is that he popularized something called New Calvinism then sort of formalized it with 12 points of new Calvinism with complementarianism being a cornerstone tenet. Mm. If you're familiar with the quote unquote young, restless and reformed movement, uh, this is sort of the new school, which us old schoolers are like, nah, dude, that's not. (laughs) (laughs) Personally, I sort of describe this quote unquote new Calvinism as taking the doctrines of grace known as tulip and credo baptizing them in a Baptist hermeneutic 
uh, and American evangelicalism, dispensational eschatology, and cultural traditionalism with a splash of charismaticism. I mean, it's that like hodgepodge of a... Ooh, it's a little uh, bit of everything. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've been saying for quite a while that complementarianism is not reformed, meaning it's not in line with the reformed confessions. I'm willing to bet it's not in line with the Augsburg. And then the final thing that I want to point out, because I think that this is a problem, Al Mohler, I think he's currently the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's talked about the 10 points on complementarianism in the SBC, and he makes this point. The biblical teaching about women in ministry is not about ordination because Southern Baptists do not believe in ordination or a clerical class. There is an argument that says, quote, a woman can do everything a non-ordained man can do, end quote. The problem with this is, according to Muller, is that we are Baptists and have no theology of ordination whatsoever. For that reason, we have to understand that the pastoral office and pastoral function are the same thing. So I bring this up because we've just talked about ordination, right? There's this question about whether women can be ordained. And I think it needs to be pointed out that complementarianism is definitely Baptist, Baptist in that they have no doctrine of ordination. It's all function. I think that creates a problem, and we're going to flesh that out a little bit more and explain why. I hope you're enjoying today's episode of Dare to Think. This episode is a pared-down version of my full interview with Deaconess DeGroote. In the uncut version, we also discuss hierarchy, authoritarianism in the church, and a woman's Christian liberty. But to listen to the whole interview, you must be one of my monthly members. Monthly members get exclusive rewards, including access to a members-only forum, discounts on any of my web courses, and live quarterly Q&As. For a limited time, I'm also giving away free signed copies of the new book I co-authored with the guys from the Libertarian Christian Institute called Faith Seeking Freedom, Libertarian Christian Answers to Tough Questions. You don't want to miss this. You can join for as little as $4 a month. This allows me to produce this content full-time. For more info and to join, please visit mereliberty.com slash membership. Now let's get back to the episode. Tell me what you do as a deaconess or what a deaconess in the LCMS does. Sure, sure. So, you know, they they work in parishes, in hospital settings. A lot of them are what's called CP or yeah, CPE, clinical pastor. So they do like um, chaplaincy, hospital chaplaincy. They can work in the military, prisons, prison chaplains. The yeah. LCMS um, is, is that specific, you know, like the institutions and parishes. And the institutions can vary from, you know, secular institutions that want a chaplain or um, what we call RSOs in the LCMS recognized service organizations. So mm-hmm. they can work with, you know, adoption agencies or Mm-hmm. You know, any any number of um I'm trying to say, oh, like Bethesda. Bethesda's yeah. a big one. We have actually several deaconesses that that serve there. So Okay. Um and Bethesda is a an organization that works with people with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Um okay. they have a lot of um homes and, and resources all internationally, but I think they're actually international. But anyway. right. And your seminary trained for this, right? Correct. Yes. Okay, so I want to ask you some burning questions. Do you read scripture from the pulpit or lectern? I don't. (laughs) Okay. Do you teach adult Bible study following the divine service? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can women be Bible scholars in the LCMS? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can women be seminary professors? You know, in terms of the seminary as training grounds for the formation of men to become pastors, um, no. And and yet we do have a deaconess program. And so we do have uh, deaconess instructors for our program as well. So, okay. The Presbyterians um, has a very simple description for office of deacon. They're, they're basically just, you know, managing the finances of the church. Let's jump into the history of deaconesses and Marta Mort and this historical study. I found this book fascinating. 
and brilliantly honest. What Martimort does is he gives you an entire survey of church history and he says, well, not necessarily like it was yeah. it was really spotty. You mentioned checkered. So yeah. mm-hmm. tell me more about what Martimort has to say about the history of deaconesses. I'm I'm pretty sure there's at least two or three chapters, like maybe towards the beginning. And for some reason, of course, I couldn't find it where it was like the first line was like, and there were no deaconesses in Egypt, you know, or like yeah. there were no, de-, you know, so it was just like, like you said, very plain and very mm-hmm. uh, straightforward. And then, you know, the ones that we do find are typically women of means like Macrina mm-hmm. and Olympia in like the third and fourth centuries. And so now you have this interesting dynamic of what these women were called as deaconesses, but they were also women of means. And yeah. so culturally, they had a little influence and in how that played out in the proliferation of the early church. It's interesting that they would call them deaconesses, and yet there was no real specific office of deaconess. Although I think in the Council of Chalcedon, they do talk about like, it's a, like an honorable mention or something yeah. um, in their discussions. And so, you know, here I am sitting in seminary and I'm like, what's this vocation all about? You know, like, is this mm-hmm. a real thing? And here I am like reading this book and I'm like, well, it wasn't a real thing for a long time, you know? Yeah. So- <laughs> Towards the end of Martimort's book, he asks, who and what were deaconesses? And I'm uh, extrapolating a quote from him. He says, the Christians of antiquity did not have a single fixed idea of what deaconesses were supposed to be. More and more, however, they placed the accent on the scriptural counsels concerning widows so that deaconesses very soon came to be considered a consecrated state of life. He says the Greek and Eastern canonists of the Middle Ages were even less able than those of antiquity to know who and what deaconesses were. One of the results of our study has been to recognize that the word deaconess has been used very differently from one church to another and from one age to another. The continuity of a true ecclesiastical tradition was lacking in the case of deaconesses. And then finally, he says, if such a ministry of deaconess was necessary, it did not necessarily follow that deaconesses had to be created in order to carry out the ministry. The didascalia itself said it could be carried out by simple matrons. So you didn't even need, you know, a title or that consecration, that blessing. So according to scripture, it could be confided to uh, widows who had precedence, i.e. hierarchy. There's there's a popular book out right now called The Making of Biblical Womanhood. It's sort of a refutation by a Baptist woman by the name of Beth Allison Barr. She is a medieval historian. She's offered a number of examples of how women were ordained as deaconesses. She appeals to Phoebe and a number of other women. But I'm a little disappointed because she is a historian. Mm-hmm. She's a medieval historian, and Martimord is saying that these historians have had a really hard time being able to say, yes, definitively, the church was ordaining deaconesses. It's so varied, so inconsistent that we can't actually pin that down, even when we have positive examples. And then the other thing that he brings up, he asks, were uh, deaconesses ordained deacons? So there's the distinction between deacons and deaconesses. He says, it was precisely in the Eastern regions where deaconesses did exercise a liturgical role in the baptism of women, namely among the Chaldeans, that the pontificals expressly excluded any ambiguity about the nature of the ordination that deaconesses received. He says, quote, the bishop prays putting his hand on her head, but not as for an ordination, but rather as for a benediction. What I gather that he's saying here is that the Eastern churches probably had the highest view of deaconesses, but they still weren't ordained. Correct. So I think that's interesting to point out because Beth Allison Barr is claiming that deaconesses were ordained to the office of deacon. And I think also there is a distinction mm-hmm. that Marta Mort points out. Um, I think Olson also points out in uh, the other book that that you showed me. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between deacons and deaconesses. There's also another um, article written by a reformed guy named Schwartley. 
I'm going to post that in my show notes, where he also says, look, even where there were deaconesses per se, they were not ordained deacons, they were under deacons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so this is like the perennial issue, because of course, the LCMS is very clear, you know, on our doctrine of ordination. I would say, you know, yes, Janine Olson, who I got to meet, actually, she's a professor in, at Rhode Island College, you know, she she's actually ELCA. And it's interesting, um, you know, she just has such a a broad view of of deacons and deaconesses and and just is is an academic in the sense of you know compiling data you mm-hmm. know of of what what was and what is at this point and so what you see is the sectarianism almost when it comes to this issue where women all of a sudden are like and church bodies start to talk about women's ordination um, you see a splintering off and obviously mm-hmm. it it happens in very you know for other issues as well but for this one and and definitely for the LCMS you, um you'll see and this is kind of one of the reasons of the split between the LCMS and the ELCA Then all of a sudden, you know, these women are thinking, well, if everybody's a minister, which is kind of a mantra, right, of, of evangelicalism, yeah. you know, then why can't I be a pastor? Mm-hmm. And so all of a sudden, you know, the seminaries are responding to the need that women want to be theologically trained and they want yeah. to. And frankly, I just want to be upfront too. They receive female students too, just for the Master of Arts program, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Um, so you don't have to be a deaconess. Complementarianism and egalitarianism rely on some assumptions American evangelicals make about ordination. One, that men are automatically qualified for leadership in ministry simply because they're men. And two, the overuse and misuse of the word ministry. Church officers cross-denominationally will sometimes delegate ordinal tasks to non-ordained men. Scripture doesn't allow for such delegation unless one is being evaluated for possible ordination. When unordained men are conducting themselves in ordained capacities, it's easy to see why women would feel left out. American evangelicalism is largely influenced by Baptist doctrine and culture. For them, everything is a ministry. Al Mohler insists that complementarianism doesn't extend male headship to all aspects of society. But if the function of leadership is always reserved for men and the majority of church work is considered a ministry, or women shouldn't hold positions of authority over men outside the church, then you're left with an unbiblical exclusion of women from vocations God may have actually called them to. But before we go further, let's hear what a historically orthodox view of why Presbyterians and Lutherans only ordain men. Is it fundamentally patriarchal too? Let's get back to the conversation. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about the theology. Why why doesn't the Bible allow for women to be ordained? Re- with regards to the debate, you know, we had talked about this a little bit. And, and actually, one of the lines in the article talking about uh, men seeing men as leaders. And I I Mm -hmm. underlined that because I think that needs to really be fleshed out. While men are considered the heads of their household, and then, you know, of course, as Lutherans, we would say the spiritual uh, leaders of their home, leadership is not like, you know, this type A kind of like, we're just, it's, Mm -hmm. it's simply the humility and sacrifice that Christ has for his church, you know, which is, which is not a hierarchical, you know, authoritarian, you know, understanding of things. And so, you know, I think you and I discussed this where, you know, when there's consternation about only men being pastors, why, you know, what, you know, is there, is it because people want to be seen or they actually understand the call, you know, of, and, yeah. and the yoke that the pastoral office is. And, and I think once you start to get into it, you know, 
people suddenly realize this is divine. This is not mm -hmm. some like, oh, I want to be seen and, and share the faith and all this. You know, our, our doctrine of vocation covers that. We can share the faith with anybody, you right. know, on in the highways and byways of life and especially within our homes. But when you're talking about, you know, the office of the keys, which the priesthood of all, of all believers, the church, you know, a local congregation has for calling a man to be their under shepherd, that's a pretty serious call. There's a reformed scholar by the name of Meredith Klein. And Meredith, yes, is a man, not, <laughs> not a oh, woman. Oh, okay. But he's, uh, he's an Old Testament scholar. He's, he's passed on now. Um, but he was really helpful in helping me to understand the importance of this gendered language that we use for for God, right? God is mm -hmm. as father, God describes himself as father. Mm -hmm. And though scripture describes maternal characteristics of God, we never refer to him as mother, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are reasons why we have this picture <clears throat> language, there are biblical theological reasons why we have this picture language. And I think it's important to note that theologically, we're <clears throat> dealing with Number one, the doctrine of the image of God and mankind. Um, and Meredith Klein was, I think, on top of this. And I know that um, Jordan Cooper has found Meredith Klein uh, useful for the Lutheran perspective. But one of his points is that, one of Meredith Klein's points is that when human beings started trying to understand the image of God and mankind, they started with mankind. And he says, we must start with God and the many theophanies that are discussed, in the, you know, which is archetypal language, which is mm -hmm. discussed in the Old Testament, in order to understand our likeness to him, right? Mm -hmm. Our relationship to him, our likeness to him, what you know, what we are as human beings is a reflection of, of him. So this requires a reorientation from an egocentric view of who we are to, a, for lack of a better word, deocentric or God-centric perspective. In other words, we don't understand God through our human gender, mm -hmm. right? We understand our humanity, which includes our gender, um, through God and the archetypal language that he offers us. And so women's ordination, I think, actually acts against this because mm -hmm. uh, you have these terms like headship. You have the fact that only men were ordained in the New Testament, um, you know, there in Matthew 28, also reinforced in 1 Timothy 2. But you have this picture language reinforced not because of any patriarchal reason, but because that's how God communicates with us. That's the language that God uses so that we can understand our relationship to him. Yes. And, and thank you for, for clarifying that. That was beautiful. Um, and I think, you know, we, we too have to understand that the language, um, it, in, especially in the Old Testament, and now I'm no Hebrew scholar, but from what my you know, Old Testament profs used to say, it's just, it can be, it can see, it can kind of make you blush because there's a lot of consum consummation language in mm -hmm. the Old Testament. And so, you know, I mean, we don't, we don't need to have a lesson on the birds <laughs> and the bees to right. understand that there is something that's happening when God is, um, imputing himself in us through grace, you know, mm -hmm. um, and through our doctrines, um, that, that, you know, our means of grace. I mean, God is doing something and he is, he is entering into us. And yeah, I mean, <clears throat> as you said, um, this is, this is very uniquely understood as a father. Um, and then obviously as a, a bridegroom to his bride, you know? Right. Well, and there's sonship. We talked about how sonship yes. is, is used to indicate not gender, but inheritance. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, and women are included in that. Yes. Right? In the New Testament, women are included in that. And so mm -hmm. the, the, the point I think is not, you know, to say, nope, women, right. You know, thus far, no farther. It's, it's, we're being included in, in the sonship. We are, mm -hmm. uh, and men are included in the bride of Christ. Yes. And this is, this is archetypal language, which means, you know, the, Using the feminine and masculine in archetypal language is only meant to indicate relationship, not meant to confer gender characteristics per se. Or, um, yeah, right and, right. and I think, you know, that's really important.
I've loved this conversation and I've Me got so too. many notes, so many notes that <laughs> we could too. like I didn't get to any of that. <laughs> oh no. Well, no. we'll we'll have to have another conversation, but That'd really I want to be able to throw this this episode out there and be like, look, guys, there's more to this discussion than just who's who's got the better deal, men or women, right? Mm -hmm. I think the complementarian egalitarian debate has com completely missed it. As I said earlier, complementarianism is not reformed or Lutheran. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, we said Lutherans have a view of deaconesses that is not ordained. So mm -hmm. it is in line with the Augsburg Confession. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned, I know in our conversations, that it's always pointing to yes. um, the pastor and you know the gospel saying, okay, this is where you go now. Like, go, get, go get Jesus. <laughs> yes. You know, that's what we're doing when, when we share the gospel is we're sharing something with a neighbor or a friend, and then we're inviting them and we're pointing them back to uh, the church and word and sacrament and all mm -hmm. of those wonderful gifts. So the Lutheran perspective is, yes, deaconesses, no ordained, mm -hmm. uh, no orda ordination of women. You know, deaconesses don't do these things that the egalitarians are saying women should be able to do, uh, like, you know, read scripture from the pulpit or teach adult mm -hmm. Bible study or that sort of thing. Yeah. I think that the takeaway from the Presbyterian perspective is that we don't have a title for deaconess, but we can do the same things you're doing. Oh, absolutely. And I just want to say, you know, when, when I was at seminary, it was just more or less like I was asking that very same question. It's like, why mm -hmm. is this any different than just what I've been doing all my entire life, you know, yeah. in the church, you know, serving in whatever capacity. And that's, and it's true, you know, and so women being theologically trained, I think is definitely an asset to have biblical scholars, female biblical scholars, um, but always with the intent to compel others to be with Jesus, you know, yeah. to, to, to simply know where the gifts are and to show that expression of love and mercy to our neighbor and, and just live that life of repentance and forgiveness, that baptismal yeah. life, you know, yeah. throughout, throughout our days. Yeah. Well, for my listeners, I'm going to be putting um, many links and resources in the show notes so that you can take a look. Um, I'm offering this as a counter narrative, not just to the complementarian view, but also the egalitarian view. Um, I would say it's a reformed view. It's a Lutheran view. It's a historically orthodox view. And it does not demean women. It rightly recognizes our, our gifts as uh, regenerate in God's eyes. So Amen. Thank, thank you so much for, yeah, being, thank you. for, for being with me for this. <laughs> what makes Baptists Baptist is in part because of their rejection of a doctrine of ordination. This means they only have gender to interpret passages such as Matthew 28 and 1 Timothy 2 and others. Deaconess de Grote mentioned that this debate really isn't a thing in the LCMS. Many Reformed believers tend to be converts from the Baptist Church through so-called New Calvinism. Baptist doctrine has found its way into Reformed Presbyterianism, where our doctrine of ordination is not inherently based in gender, but is effectively under attack, not from women, but from complementarianism and the underlying assumption that the special office of the ministry is primarily based on function, not ordination. The decision Baptists made back in the 17th century to reject a doctrine of ordination is now coming to a head. The long-term, unintended consequences of this decision is resulting in a terrible choice for Baptists. Either they double down on gender and embrace patriarchalism, thereby excluding women from vocations perfectly appropriate for them, or they have to admit egalitarians have a point about deaconesses and acquiesce to women being pastors. The only other choice is to embrace a doctrine of ordination and leave women free in Christ to pursue their non-ordained vocations. But this fundamentally undermines what it means to be a Baptist. While this is a conundrum for Baptists, it's not for Presbyterians. Simply realize that complementarianism is not compatible with our historic Reformed confessions. You've been listening to Dare to Think, the official podcast of MereLiberty.com. 
I'm Carrie Baldwin, and I'm an independent researcher and writer working outside academia. My mission is to challenge and rethink our paradigms for understanding society by applying reformed theology and philosophy to politics, religion, and culture in order to encourage individual freedom and responsibility within our own spheres of influence. This episode was created due to the generous support of my patrons and underwriters. I'm so very grateful to Bob, Patrick and Shannon, Dave and Nina, Jean, John, and my newest patron, Tom, for helping me get this episode published. If you've enjoyed today's episode and would like to join me and my other patrons and underwriters in our effort, you can sign up at mereliberty.com slash membership. Joining on a monthly membership comes with exclusive rewards and premium content. Alternatively, you can choose a one-time donation. You'll find a direct link to the membership page in the description to this episode. You can listen to more episodes by subscribing on virtually any podcatcher, and you can read my articles on mereliberty.com and the Libertarian Christian Institute, where I'm a regular contributor. You can also find me on social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Minds, and Locals.